so today i'll be presenting uh, the book deep thinking uh, where machine intelligence ends and human creativity begins this book is by gary kasparov uh, and just to put things in perspective vedant's presentation mostly talked about the past and the future so i think this book is placed in the present it okay. mostly talks about what is going on and how to go from there and who is kasparov yeah <laughs> oh there we go okay here we go this is the <laughs> gary kasparov uh, it's mostly a household name in many of the asian uh, countries and also russia and what defeated by the ibm system yeah yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the part so uh, he is very popular in chess he has been the youngest uh, world chess champion uh, in 1985 at the age of 22 and he held the title of uh, the grand undefeated grandmaster for almost 15 years uh, even after ibm defeated him he was still the grandmaster <laughs> until a human actually defeated him later <laughs> and caspro has written many books on chess during his time as a grandmaster but after he retired i think in 2006 he started exploring uh, the aspects of uh, i mean he was very active in politics but apart from that he also explored the influence of machines that are there in the present society and so on. where does he live now does anybody know where does he live he lives in new york in new york yeah because uh, he had a very I'm sorry? big beef definitely the market in russia yeah right <laughs> right that was the reason i meant yeah. because he had a very big beef with uh, putin and then well, he moved his base from russia to yeah. new york and Even he also right democratic values this is going to be a problem for <laughs> and he also talks about how people in new york do not notice him whereas in russia people used to like storm his very <laughs> okay. taste for autographs so he was a very influential person in the domain of chess yes and just a very brief overview of the book uh, and some interesting facts that i know of it so deep thinking this was released in 2017 uh, looks at the relationship between human intelligence chess and artificial intelligence uh, and chess grandmaster gary castro gives readers a look into his favorite game and explains how computers have already surpassed human intelligence at least when it comes to playing chess and this came out almost 20 years after he was de- defeated by ibm's deep blue and uh, in his own words this is the first book that has all the facts and only one that has my side of the story <laughs> it has been fulfilling to finally find the truth at the heart of deep blue so gary castro is very competitive and apparently he doesn't accept failure so once he got defeated by deep blue he did not make a media appearance uh, for almost like 20 years mm-hmm. but after that he released the book and then started uh, visiting different companies and giving talks regarding this particular thing and in this image is gary oh, is gary playing with uh, murray campbell uh, murray campbell was one of the creators of deep blue at mm-hmm. ibm and interesting thing is that dr chi who is in our lab currently was an intern uh, with uh, mare back at ibm oh, wow. and the whole concept of deep blue itself was a uh, mare's thesis during his uh, phd days uh-huh. that time it was called as deep thought but when ibm bought the idea and him uh, they renamed it to deep blue because ibm was called as big blue back then yeah. and the contents for today's slides would be uh, i'll start i mean i just glean some of the most important points after reading this book and try to organize them into some sections that we can go through there are a lot of other parts as well which i would probably miss in this presentation so we'll start with uh, should we trust the machines and following which we'll talk about the rise of intelligent machines and then we'll subdue them by talking about the pitfalls of intelligent <laughs> machines then we'll talk about gary's perspective on what is performance and what are methods in the ai perspective then he gives a rich history of chess and how people play chess and how chess is one of the inspirations uh, for the community the ai community itself and why ai community wanted to uh, get into chess in the very first place and defeat the then grand grandmasters and last two slides are uh, basically some of the lessons that i have learned uh, by reading this book and finally conclude the presentation so during uh, the first four chapters of the book gary mostly talks about uh, similarly like isaac isomov where he says that you should not be uh, offended or feel gullible with the advancements of technology although all the menial tasks would be replaced 
you should always welcome technology and uh, he ends the introduction with a very insightful observation saying we'll face something new something unsettling when we ride the first autonomous car or first time the computer boss issues an order at work we must face these fears in order to get the most out of our technology and to get the most out of ourselves so i'm not sure about the computer boss aspect of this but i think the autonomous car is where we are currently at and i personally felt the first four chapters were pretty boring and i thought people would comment that this book is very intuitive and everybody should accept technology that has been there for a long time and the first four chapters repeatedly keep talking about yes, this took it very personally because this <laughs> yeah. book happened long ago yes. out of its time of technology yeah. but if you look at today geopardy alpha go things you know lot of things surprises you man yeah yeah now nobody is taking it seriously but that time it was he is the first man who got defeated by machines so. yeah he was the first man who also accepted the challenge so ibm sent out invitations to all the grandmasters back then uh, to play against the computer but none of them accepted and he was the only one who signed up for it but nobody talks about gary actually defeating ibm deep blue in the very first uh, competition that they had it was in the second time right. that ibm improved by a lot had more competition power and then defeated so mm-hmm. gary keeps emphasizing that you should all uh, know that i first defeated yeah. it is only after that that they learned even better they learned all my moves yeah. and then they came back at me with more uh, uh-huh. improved technology so coming to the rise of intelligent machines uh, we are heading into an automated and artificially intelligent future at rapidly increasing speed and we don't get to pick and choose when technological progress stops or where and from his book uh, he says that our attitude towards ai matters and not because we can stop the march of technological progress even if we wanted to but because our perspective on disruption affects how well prepared for it will be each of us has a choice to make to embrace the future and shape the terms of our relationship with new technology or resist and let others force the terms on us and the book progresses from human versus machine which is uh, which is present in his first couple of chapters to uh, humans plus machines how they can collaboratively team up in order to achieve a particular task which i think is the main theme that gary was trying to arrive at and even when he played against deep blue apparently during his mind it was constantly running that i'm playing against a system but it would be very much more novel if a system is playing along with me against a 2v2 match a mm-hmm. uh, human and he wanted to actually see how deep blue performs in coordination with a human and he proposed that to ibm but apparently they uh, did not let that go through and coming to the most interesting slides uh, of the entire presentation the pitfalls of intelligent machines Gary points out a lot of interesting faults in the existing intelligent machines. He first ridicules them by calling seemingly interesting machines from chapter 5 onwards where previously he was talking about like intelligent machines and so on. And a little bit of history, Gary defeats 32 chess playing machines in a simultaneous combat. Uh, so this was the picture from that time and each of these machines were being so they were outputting the next set of moves and a person is actually manually moving them. but gary says that uh, however if a machine is ought to play in a simul playing chess would not be its biggest problem but to move around coordinate and to understand which player it needs to go and do the move is something that it might fail at and he also says that uh, pablo picasso called out computers as useless as they only give you answers can't and ask questions. can't ask questions and also an answer to a question according to picasso just limits your thinking as to what you should think forward from there <laughs> and throughout the book uh, gary talks about moravec's paradox which says that hard problems for humans are easy for machines and easy problems are hard mm-hmm. and machines are entirely free of doctrine and prejudice that's not true the interesting thing is that this thing that is hard has many different dimensions yeah so hard uh, so could be that something that we are really requires a lot of computation but the computation is minimalist the computation is clear what you need so it is easier for machine obviously right and we will get tired we will uh, and keep up with the right you know details and all this stuff the other aspects of hard uh, which then uh, was creativity novelty uh, originality 
Well, those are hard in a very different way, and that may or may not be that may not be uh, possible for machines, right? right. Cannot be simple for machines, right? right. Or, or, or it may be very different. You know, I think it's the issue of creativity um, in machine by machines is, is something kind of evolving, and uh, even the notion of creativity is evolving. Yes. Um, maybe human creativity is of a different kind than machine creativity. I mean, Today, machines are AI programs are coming out some brilliant images. Now, it's hard to say there's something you know interesting about it. It's interesting about it, right? They can, right. So, to the extent that you really come up with um, um, uh, a new uh, modern art, you know, abstract painting, I think it's quite possible. Uh, that yes. machine does, Even the rap song, you share the video. <laughs> Yeah. 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 And my own personal interest is, and by the extension, hopefully, interest of many of you is that you'll be inspired by computer science and neuroscience in looking deeply at methods where um, uh, we can make machines smarter than we are today. Right. Um, and, and also, other way of putting it is that they are smarter uh, in a way where they are required to use things beyond this uh, brute force of statistics uh, of you know computing a uh, lot of connection you know correlations with all kinds of stuff which is what the deep neural networks do that's a big they have succeeded exceptionally well for a very limited set of tasks among the tasks that has to be done and we need to constantly uh, you know pay attention that this is a task they've done very well it's hard to beat them I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to worry about this other task. <laughs> they can't do well. Right. And let's show how, what are the issues involved there. For example, tasks that may really involve reasoning. And uh, just a moment ago, we were discussing, um, you know, uh, this proposal we are doing. And um, uh, Oshik had gone and we actually uh, reviewed um, uh, Corey's uh, uh, dissertation and other work that we did on semantic perception. And he also made connection with some wonderful, uh, with a great note that uh, uh, Nambang you know, and AI. Uh, and what was that? Uh, so, uh, the page that you showed of that programming? Green program. Huh? Green yeah, but there was a term for that. <coughs> huh? Ancestral. Yeah, ancestral programming. And I think those were, uh, you know, uh, going along the, um, anyway. So if you think about, the kind of problem we try to solve with um, uh, Cody's work and why I was excited about it is that um, we get a variety of signals. You know, the human uh, you know, uh, senses are um, uh, being bombarded with 11 million bits per second estimate okay, of, 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 of content, of data. And um, if that if the, what the human is doing is uh, reading, then human is converting at 11 million bits per second into um, 50, 60 bits, right? And what would that 50, 60 bits be? Is that you are re you are reading something and you are able to characterize what you read, right? So the, you are you are uh, retaining your, you know connecting what you're reading to concepts that you have that you can verbalize yourself, right? That's what. Yeah. That's the abstraction, basically. Match number of data to the abstraction that you can now verbalize in this case, right? that you can retain also. That is the real interesting thing. So the real interesting, of, I mean, I'll give all the credit to all the great achievement of the neural network sector, that is. But the real challenge is not, or, or the hard challenge is not uh, that there is a corpus of, um, uh, you know, the web. The hard challenge is that there is 11 billion bits per second that your human senses are getting every second 
and collectively there's so many things happening in the world mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know we are going on creativity productive decision making choosing to decide this next or pay attention to this all those things are doing so the job that we are doing is far more exciting and complicated and it is not that you have to learn um, uh, uh, what you can learn from a purpose that was uh, dated to September 2021. It is going on continuously. And then uh, we are going to incorporate, you know, what we remember from childhood to this latest thing that we have come across and act upon it. Yeah. And the process is cycling, continuous, continuous. Right? So beautiful thing about, you know, uh, the line of code is work is that we are really engaged in this continuous process, which leads to the action, which leads to the decisions. This is deciding that. Uh, so there are some demos we had in those that there was a master's thesis work that Harshal Patni did. Uh, that was you know Kori uh, was a good mentor to Harshal and to promote promote the very really interesting work we remember in this uh, area, area data uh, on transportation on traffic. So um, they, you know, solving the problem with a, um, you know, objective reasoning, saying that here you have a signal, create a hypothesis of what the signal is. Signal is, uh, you know, higher temperature. Hypothesis is there is a fire. Now the question is, what kind of fire? So what should I look for? What do I need so that I can decide it's a wood fire or chemical fire? getting that signal and he designed um, inspired very high level inspiration from Narcia's work in community science. He was a bachelor's student in community science okay, that became a computer scientist. To regulate the, so this abduction and uh, deduction that has to happen, how do you organize that? Right? So the whole uh, intelligence of Intellego ontology was to essentially help you decide, regulate the cycle, right? That's a brilliant thing. And uh, now you look at this kind of thing, it's not a, a single shot thing of classification or prediction or recommendation. It's continuous decision making, right? So the, the, the um, uh, I think um, uh, always, you know, look at this, kind of thing, the problem that is so challenging and it's going to be very hard for the state of art to do. And when you do that, you are a winner. Okay. So the, I, I hope that half of you will find such a problem uh, in your dissertation topic and then you are a winner. So uh, continuing the same topic of pitfalls of intelligent machines, uh, machines are entirely free of doctrine and prejudice, unlike humans, is what he points out. Uh, and when Gary faced Deep Blue, he did not know what to expect from it. Chess was not only a game based on concentration and thinking, but was also dependent on emotions of the opponents, uh, which sometimes the other people who are playing against them capitalize uh, and make relevant moves. Uh, Gary, however, never understood what Deep Blue was thinking, apart from crunching numbers at scale. So he makes this statement saying that IBM actually uh, scammed him by putting a machine that does not play me, like this. Is Gary's prejudice? Yeah. <laughs> you need to yeah. answer somebody's emotion, but you don't need it. Apart from crunching numbers at scale, is what he says. Uh, it never got exhausted, uh, nor it would never surrender due to fatigue. Uh, so he says, how is it a fair competition that it is supposed to play against a human? And this is uh, from the article that he has uh, from the interview that he has given to time uh, so these were his words as how he felt when he faced deep blue so i was stunned by this pawn sacrifice uh, deep blue makes a move that gary actually does not understand so he's talking about that what could it mean i had played a lot of computers but had never experienced anything like this i could feel i could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table while i played through the rest of the game as best as i could i was lost it played beautiful flawless chess the rest of the way and won easily. These were his immediate comments uh, right after the game. But uh, we see that he says it's just crunching numbers at scale after 20 years of actually understanding what artificial intelligence is because 
and back then he did not know yeah, yeah. what what is so happening that's the behind. first thing so came did out. he study like each and every move of the machine by study you mean he was playing so he obviously is aware of after what that, this is after oh, post hoc by study what do you mean like did he analyze why it is doing no, no. so there is no reason that's what in the he could figure out the strategy yeah. he so out the that's strategy. why he says it's crunching numbers at scale rather than reasoning like a normal chess player would okay. so, uh, uh, if a computer it does not have to uh, worry about conserving the energy, you know, and, and coming up with efficient reasoning. He needs the best answer. He doesn't have to come up with to the answer in the most efficient way, which humans need to do, right? Because um, the human uh, uh, does not have, uh, you know, that much uh, computational power, uh, but it makes it up by uh, intelligent strategy. Uh, you know the, the policy it follows. Uh, you know, uh, is it crowds the space that is inside this is what I think. So uh, the rational says why it might be this. Well, not only why the player, the human player, might be doing things, but why the opponent might be doing things. That's part of the reasoning here. Right. I was uh, I was sitting around with Brian Master and Ever and they can play like three hours together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he also mentions that uh, coming after a chess game, coming out after a chess game feels like he has run a marathon. Mm -hmm. It is completely exhausting, but <clears throat> these machines do not feel it. So they do the same kind of computation over and over without getting exhausted. Whereas it's not the same for me where I'm playing like continuous machines or people and then coming to deep. So. Uh, 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 the human brain consumes uh, what number of watts? No, actually, I mean, this is the comment. So basically, the, I, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, the current uh, thing says that we have much higher computing power than any machine exists on our field. So we can actually process much more larger data and much more amount of data in a fraction of a second. I think we're here to carefully define how we process and what we let go. But and that we don't know, but yeah, so computing is higher. Um, yeah. So, so, so the example I gave, you don't really know. Just said that. Yeah. yeah. This thing, obviously, we have that discerning power of that you don't really need uh, what to focus on. You know it very well, yeah. and let go of other all these other things right. so that they are not you know affecting us. Uh, attention, focus. By the way, one of the brilliant things in uh, you know what that we did when Corey was working, <coughs> is that of so much data here. What do you pay attention to? It is a semantic perception, right? That's a part of the uh, thing that uh, there is an approach to work on that. So, mass for data, again, you know, the right situation scenario, but if you do that, that's a huge problem. One of the things that's being brought up with, with this example is whether or not the method that you use to achieve an outcome is relevant to the decision that the process is intelligent. So clearly the machine won, but what Kasparov is complaining about is that the process right. is not the same. Yes. And it's not, it, from my perspective, it's not clear to me that the process that machines use should be the same. Yeah, but I wouldn't take that for granted. People, people have disagreement on that. For me? People have disagreement on that. So one people, I, I, I probably quoted this one, uh, I know before as well, that you know some people who believe in this kind of Okay, system. They say, see, you know, aeroplanes fly longer distance, but it does not replicate the flipping wings of birds. Right, right. But, exactly. But That's we, 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 you know, uh, achieve a lot, but better things. So not necessarily machine intelligence has to be replicated exactly. of, of human. I mean, not necessary. Right. That that exact sentence is there, I think, in the next slide. So yeah, I, I don't like this thing up at the top here. Machines are entirely free of doctrine and prejudice. I doubt that assertion. Uh, so the human brain spends uh, some uh, some five watts per you know or that much energy. How much is the computer uh, computer? Yeah. That's the thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? So efficiency. Uh, that we have. We're a lot better. Michelle, I don't know if you researched this, but uh, so this is what 1986, right? 
when the competition happened 97 so i think uh, like today um, i have seen that uh, chess players when they are training themselves they use mobile apps yeah where there is a computer at the background yeah. simulating literally all the moves because yes. even our phone has a better uh, computing architecture than deep blue did or or, <laughs> or or that that you know app does it or it connected with some server server does it? do the phone oh. in house does it the chips are okay. far more powerful Okay, and kids beat those apps nowadays. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, is there still gap? Like uh, in sports, for example, tennis used to be different three years ago. Now uh, people will whitewash the kings of that because there's technological improvement in racket technology. Is there such a thing happening in chess? I feel like a kid today could beat Kasparov because he beats these apps. Oh, I I would. <laughs> I don't know. Probably he would be pissed if he hears <laughs> this, but I'm not. He'd be really upset by that experiment. He was upset that a machine. Yeah, I know. Yeah, twenty years later, he would write a book if a kid. I'm I'm not sure. Those apps because you have different levels to select. Yeah. Because really difficult. Nobody beats. Yeah. So I I just the point I was trying to make is humans adapt very quickly. Because that is that is true. He talks about the chess apps that you are mentioning when Deep Blue was processing this much. Like we also need to acknowledge the fact that the semiconductors back then it was like we are we were limited by the resources. Right now, phones itself are powerful as back then entire computer itself. So all these technological advancements might have led to building more efficient computer machines, but humans might find a way to beat. at the end of the day so and another interesting thing is looking outside in uh, a human was pointing out a lot of flaws with it by watching it on you uh, uh, right after it happened the deep blue game yeah okay so like uh, not very high level professional but even amateur chess players were saying yeah he made very stupid moves Cash yeah during this game okay so he says that both humans as well as machines make stupid moves sometimes like it's a n play game right so to give you know a different uh, you know yeah indication or be, be it whatever like or during the process of playing it might be possible that you might select a long move out of 500 million possible moves but a machine is more capable of recorrecting itself and still trying to win the game whereas a human takes some time to understand how this how his one move affected the game and how this entire discourse is going to look like so And then before they start the chess, like there are chess books of part recognition. If I see this, yes. I think yeah. humans work this. And for part recognition, they don't mind it. Well, perhaps they are not. I mean, they are much much more powerful than I mean, the best. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that is that is the way. So he says it's all it all boils down to the branching factor. Yes, look at the blue can branch out all the 500 possible moves. Mm -hmm. even though a human would cut out a lot of these 500 million possible moves given a particular because he has some patterns and he is going to still play the move he is not going to move all pawns like take care into all considerations but deep blue can make all these branching factors and still navigate and rank these okay. different moves and still get it so so there must so this is this game there must be an ecological merit to the way that we do things right mm -hmm. so the trick here has to be to find the task where that kind of exhaustive mm -hmm. algorithmic solution right. will not work okay so it, uh, just just addition I mean, maybe you would want to so you talk about creativity so i listen to uh, talk of manjul bharat one of the film analysts mm -hmm. here in canada at your institute uh, cmi long uh, i was you know initial days of my phd so he he talks about uh, you know art and mathematics together okay so he he make understand of you know mathematics using rhymes let us see rhyme is mathematics okay you understand the meter okay and let me make you understand now listen to tabla dadra and yes exactly so now you know is in the top some something is probably available you too as well so he make understand see art is not something mysterious it's all about mathematics right So maybe I mean, it's the you know creation process is not that mysterious. 
maybe machine could can learn it might be if it's mathematically representable yeah yeah he 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 make it very very lucid very you know understand mm-hmm. okay uh moving on uh then uh, after all this happened after he has released his book gary was invited to google and uh, he heard the phrase data trumps everything and he retort saying that this is not how intelligent machines are supposed to be built i think that we are all on the same page when who to say this an interesting anecdote by kathleen spracklin who is seen in the photo here uh, both her and her husband were computer scientists who devoted their lives to building chess based algorithms so she explored uh, she made a data set consisting of all grandmaster chess moves okay and in grandmaster like usually grandmasters what they do is they sacrifice their queen when the they look at the chess board they make all possible moves and if they're still going to like draw or lose they just sacrifice their queen directly like cutting short the game so she collected this particular data set and she used uh, it to train an ai agent and finally when this ai agent is playing the game it was just sacrificing the queen out of no context <laughs> okay so that is the art which grandmasters have mastered they think deliberately throughout all possible combinations but the data doesn't represent that because i'm directly sacrificing my queen right so he is strongly against the fact that data trumps everything or the approach google was following back then is the way to build intelligent machines he also has a video at google where he points it out explicitly to them saying this is not how you should be building it <laughs> and a similar observation was made by the uh, was made in the movie starman uh, it's uh, in it's a 1984 movie uh, where the starman <laughs> comes driving from his earth coast and the first time when he sees a yellow light at an intersection he just speeds up watching drivers he learned the behavior uh, so green is go red is stop but yellow is like go fast <laughs> yeah so i i i want to comment about this one One of the problems with machines now is that they don't have metacognition or at least the way that we think mm-hmm. about them right. in cognitive science which is understanding the consequences of your cognition and the consequences yeah. of your action. So when you we all laughed at yellow go very fast, why do we do that? Because we understand the consequences of that kind of reasoning right. on the potential for an accident. Exactly. Yeah. Mhm. Use that as a framework for metacognition. Yep. Yep. Some some of the tests. Yep. Yep. That's where we. That's where absolutely where we were headed. Uh, and a similar observation was seen by the most touted machine of that time, IBM's Jeopardy, mm-hmm. uh, which I'll talk about. So during its gameplay, it spewed out an answer without actually understanding the question. Mm-hmm. It's eleven, right? Two thousand eleven or something. Yeah. Yeah. Even before neural network. Yep. So. Multiple games. The only thing I can at least I know of is Deep Cube by Doctor Agastnali itself, where it could play some games, not all of them. May, maybe Vedant can add more. It it is very good at Rubik's Cube, but it it can also just from that policy that it learned to play Rubik's Cube, it can also play eight puzzle, fifteen puzzle, and so on. So I think that is possible. But whether it is generalizable to all puzzle solving is something i think they are exploring now but i am not sure so my understanding of the intelligence literature which is not something i'm super conversant in but my understanding of that literature is that it all boils down to working memory capacity it's a little uh, you know instead of you're seven uh, plus or minus two if you're a six or a seven you're in way better shape than if you're a four So that, that's the, the latest that I know about. Maybe Savannah knows something else about about this, but but G is working memory capacity. So talking a bit more about Jeopardy and its uh, creator or the person who has led that team, David Ferrucci. Uh, 
so there is an interesting story that has happened there uh, and even after the immense popularity that jeopardy attained during david's leadership where it won the game and so on he wanted to explore and explain why and how jeopardy was able to answer so he basically proposed that to ibm and they did not like it they wanted to cash out on the popularity do a couple of pr stunts and make jeopardy the next big thing in ai and like close that particular issue so, so this is something i observed uh, in real time as this was happening and this was my second such experience my first experience was in year 2001 uh, when we had the talib search engine security search engine um uh, ibm developed web content uh, so web content was a uh, project similar to whatsapp in that significant Nina happened to have an internship that went from the project uh, when, we were, when she did that. Um, and the um, mere treatment with those were from the No, never must be. So, they found it. So, um, um, I remember sitting in the conference rooms. I still walk when I go to Ivy uh, uh And uh, we integrated our search engine with the founder. So, the founder was basically IR based thing, their information minor. And they are all you know, standard keyword based uh, kind of algorithms or keyword based trusted algorithms, not. And it was also symmetric, not graph based model. So there was a perfect complement. <laughs> but uh, they found that uh, and you fail because of this similar kind of thing that uh, IBM did that. They um, uh, again wanted um, uh, to not build the business the right way. And this is what happened earlier to me. When at L4 I had InfoHunter, where I wanted to make a web search engine, uh, uh, you know, facilitate search engine 1994 with Mozilla. But at L4 there were uh, um, MBA guy, guys who were making those decisions, uh, you know, business, when you do business, you have to talk to MBA guys. MBA guys are doing, you know, stupid as far as. <laughs> The same thing here. That these are executives that are coming from finance and uh, you know uh, management uh, disciplines, but not engineer to get this thing. Uh, so uh, if you look at IBM's uh, uh, CEOs, uh, Krishna Karan is a engineer. He was an engineer. So that that makes great sense. Some of those before uh, were uh, you know uh, financial guys and that kind of CFO particular. Uh, four of my schools work here um, while on uh, while Watson, you know. So the idea was building a Watson business, and they had a Watson for life science business. So Pablo Mendes, uh, Mina Nagraj, Kartik Ramakrishnan, Mina Nagraj, and um, uh, Sujan. They were all Watson. I bought IBM's Watson business. In fact, Sujan, IBM Watson business had eight thousand people. Uh, and Sujan, in on his eighth month of in joining IBM, got the Super uh, Employee Award. Uh, out of 8,000, he got award in the first year of his being there. But the reason we know that is because of the same kind of stuff. Where uh, part of what's information focused on pharmacovigilance, they all doing this. They are interested in you know building some nice spreadsheet uh, and business models. But not really to really understand the technical challenges involved in this thing happen and sustain by all the stuff. And that's why these things fail. Yeah. Anyway, this is, to, um, you know, this is important uh, for you guys also because some of you go to industry. And when you, all, when you make the strategic decisions as to whether you want to work on this team or that team, it is very important uh, for your partner that you understand. Uh, whether the part of the company, the project that you work on, is and has a sustainable model. If it does not, you should transition out to other parts that it has and save yourself a lot of things because then that thing will be stopped and you will be laid off, just like the soon will be laid off. Uh, so uh, these are the important things that you have to uh, learn yourself to. I think there's a, a substantive issue at stake here, and I just want to follow up on something that Vedant said, that market forces are the things that drive improvement. I think this is a really good example how near-term market considerations 
in fact, led you in the wrong direction. And another point on top of that that I'd like to make is that we can look at, at, at this experience and reflect on what it means for research to be good. And I, I would say that that is a classic ill-structured problem. It's very hard to define what it means for something to be good, but that is the edge of creativity that I think we should be focusing on. The other day, I was trying to help you explain uh, the reason behind the success of a past is the high citation rate as to what kind of problem selection they do. Uh, to generally, I want the schools to, you know, take the lead in the selection of problem, not being them. So, but nevertheless, they uh, steered along the lines where you, um, you know, define, find the right problem. That's the new Anyway. Okay. So they made that bad move of wanting to replace Jeopardy with a doctor. And <coughs> I think IBM has been a sinking ship since that particular move. But David left IBM uh, after this particular decision and joined Bridgewater Associates uh, to explore why uh, any AI works, not just Jeopardy. Yeah, he mostly talks about cognition now. And I think he's at Northeastern or Northwestern. I'm, I'm not he's sure. Probably he's Northwestern. Professor. Yeah, huh? he's a professor. Now. He came back to the U. Not unaffiliated. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Collecting all this information that is. Yeah. So collecting all this information that is present in the book and trying to relate it with what we do at AASC. Uh, so some of the examples that I could think of, also which were some of them which were written in the book are uh, if we look at the world of NLP, and this particular sentence, the safe didn't fit through the door, but it was too narrow and what it actually refers to. And if we modify the sentence to something like- Association problem. Yeah. The safe didn't fit through the door, but it was too wide. And what it means now. Uh, so I think it is uh, the answer to this probably doesn't lie in NLP or NER techniques as such. You can correct me if I'm wrong or any learned sentence structure, but the common sense yeah. aspect of no, it no, that- this is, this is syntactic. Okay. So, so this so, is syntactic? Yeah, yeah. So see, I, I see I feel our fly. So what, who was right? I was right or I think I was right. So this is called you know, association problem. Mm -hmm. So all these dependency parts are actually built on top of this. This is a projection problem. Okay. So this two narrow is associated with what? Right. Well, it's the it. The it is, ah, the, so it is, is the problem. Okay, what does the it, it refer to? Okay, so yeah, it, this is another problem. The it is referred to what? So basically this is a syntactic problem. Mm -hmm. But I think it, eventually boils from that, having the common sense. No, that, that's not going to solve the problem. Uh, you can determine that the door is too narrow, but that's not. The, no, no, see, see, see. The, the problem the solution mechanism is, so ultimately you have to understand the meaning, right? Right. Let's say uh, I like chocolate and I don't like chocolate. The meaning is different only for syntax, right? Don't right. is modifying like. So <laughs> here also association. Mm -hmm. Your this adjective or the, you know, NP charm is connected with what? It's connected with it. It is a you know, pronoun, so it is referring to which noun pronoun? It's elliptic to what? So if you connect these dots by syntactic understanding, you can understand the meaning. So well, you can understand the meaning, but how does this parsing help you solve the problem? Because you understand, see, you know. Well, what are you going to do about this? Are you going to are you going to break through the door, or are you going to change the safe, or what are you going to do? I mean, no, there's no there's, no, that's where to go from this. No, that's a different story. But to understand the meaning of it, you have to understand these connections. So doctor, that's what mm -hmm. it is grammatically wrong. Then no, no. See, then you are giving wrong input to system. So that's the different term. No, wrong. You are giving syntactically incorrect input, but it's not wrong input. For example. Oh, well, the point is, humans can say this, so in that sense, it's not wrong. I mean, we can live with this kind of uh, inaccuracy or imperfection, and uh, get enough out of it and understand what it is trying to convey. So, uh, you know, expecting that you give machine only quote unquote in particular syntactic and linguistically correct is not the right thing. I think okay, so let me add. Okay, so to this and to what the uh, question said. Okay, so when Twitter came uh, and you know people started doing NLP on Twitter, <coughs> so one assumption was that you know, Twitter has a lot of you know, syntactic problems and etc. So, can we make a system which can syntactically correct it and then we apply our NLP? 
ಅನ್ನೋದು ಪಡೆಯುವಂತ ದೆನ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಓಕೆ ವೈ ಡೋಂಟ್ ವಿ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರ್ ಟ್ವಿಟರ್ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಇಸ್ ನ್ಯೂ ಲ್ಯಾಂಗ್ವೇಜ್ ಲೆಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಲ್ ಯು ನೋ ದ ಮೆಕಾನಿಸಮ್ ಆನ್ ಟಾಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೊ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಡಿ ದಟ್ so that's the way you know people evolve uh, obviously those things are gone now now we, we don't do dependent parsing but this is this is well well this is probably i might have put the wrong example but yeah. but would you say that common sense reasoning should be more explored in the context of nlp no see to my understanding the connection of common sense is which you can't detect using mathematical relation and linguistic definition mm-hmm. which you learn by your cognition to to the world every day so this is not that example right you might have a, you know better example but this is purely syntactic linguistic problem okay, okay. so oh, you are not you know <laughs> <laughs> so So Gary finally says that uh, he has seen progress from Deep Blue to AlphaGo, which was already released by the time that he has released this book, and still feels that intelligent machines have a long way to go. Uh, computationally developed machines is what we currently have, but they are nowhere near uh, intelligence. And he also talks about performance versus methodologies in AI. So performance is the ability for a machine to perform a particular task, and method is the way it understands how to perform. so the whole can it think kind of questioning is what he is addressing here and throughout the book kasparov has interesting discussion discussions on performance over methods and interestingly when it comes to machine intelligence we confuse performance the ability of machine to replace or surpass a human with methods that is it has unlocked the secrets of human cognition and intelligence regarding deep blue he says instead of a computer that thought and played like a human with human creativity and intuition they got one played that system, they got one that played systematically winning with brute number crunching force that is something that we were discussing before and of course the machines need not do the same way as nature to be effective airplanes do not have flapping wings right. helicopters do not have wings right. and wheels don't exist in nature right. when he uh, so david ferrucci and uh, uh caspro also have met and when he asked uh, david does watson think after the whole jeopardy thing so david answers saying does the submarine swim so, <laughs> <laughs> very smart people <laughs> david is an rti analyst david is what rpi oh rp rpi oh i was looking for that okay rpi oh, that is why they have a new Try to solve plausible problems. I mean, we do newspaper. Uh-huh. So people 
Maximum for size is called that. I think you guys are way too preoccupied with puzzles. <laughs> that is a certain kind of structured problem with very clear outcome criteria that is not typical of everyday human cognition. You are not wandering around every day solving a crossword puzzle, doing chess, or anything even remotely like that. And what one of the problems with the puzzles is that the inputs are pre-parsed. The representation is already created. And one of the things that we do very, very well is create new representations for direct experience. So I, I, ob I object to this. <laughs> I mean, we, we in cognition, we studied chess in the 60s and 70s. I suppose there are a few people who are still doing it, but we're like, we've moved on. <laughs> Like, so, so it's also uh, recyclable games, right? Yeah. When uh, computation theory was developed, chess uh, is the holy grail. Now it is AlphaGo or whatever. But if you think of, say, the crypt analysis as a game, computers cannot do that. That's why we have secure credit cards. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so uh, it also depends on the puzzle is basically defined as a game that is solvable in polynomial. And uh, computers. Why wouldn't computers do that? Uh, like Turing did that, right? With a computer. Uh, the crypt you, analysis. Yeah. You know how he did it. Oh, uh, I know something, but I'm not sure if we are so thinking the same thing. It is an empty heart problem in the worst case. He found the clue that showed him what path to follow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, in the worst. Oh right. Yeah, yeah. it is prime factorization in the worst. But I what I mentioned, I saw what image over here. So that there are machines, you know, one one station, and there are you know, sitting machines in the classroom. They're teaching, you know, learn capture. So, be, <laughs> so you know, capture is being asked to you to prove, you know, you are human being, and they are learning it. Okay, and do this, you know, the, this, you know, chase and etc. So I believe again, I, I mentioned this earlier. I don't have, have you know how he has a job. So see, this happened to him at the time. So he said, "Wow, this is very complex thing." Uh, you know, machine can't solve it. Then it's got solved. Oh, no, it's not AI. I mean, yeah, it's a brute force, you know, algorithm, it's a bad, you know, yeah. downgrade this. I said, okay, yeah, can you, can you do this geopolitics, natural language, more complex, and etc. So, oh, yeah, it's not AI. It's, you know, yeah, it's a great, you know, IS system, you know, we have a lot of computation shown and blah, blah. Then people saw a ago. Oh, okay. So, this is the way, I mean, you know, science is. You solve the problem, you move to the you know, next bigger one and you move on and keep developing better things. This is just a recapitulation of the same argument that we've had trying to distinguish between human intelligence and animal intelligence. So, you know, there'll be people that say, well, you know, humans can use tools. And then there'll be people who look at animals and say, well, you know, the, the monkey uses a stick to get the ants, et cetera. And, you know, we keep changing the task, but that's actually a productive thing. Yeah, yeah, Try to narrow yeah. the comparison narrows down the the human capability and human skill. Yeah. I'll try to wrap up my <laughs> <laughs> maybe. So I also wanted to add uh, the rich history of chess that Kasparov mentions in his book. That he starts off his book with talking about all the grandmasters that he has played against and so on. He or uh, and he also explains why chess was considered by AI folks, which I'm not going through in this one. Uh, so he, this is something that I found interesting. Once in the middle of a tough match, uh, Mikhail Tal, who was a grandmaster back then, wandered into the Russian children's uh, poem. Like a match was going on, he was playing it, but his mind wandered into the Russian children's poem by Corny. Uh, and this particular phrase occurred to him, which which is, oh, what a difficult job it was to drag out the drag out of the marsh the hippopotamus. And he thought about the poem, he came back like the other person made the moves. So now it's his turn to move. And when he came out of the imagination, the board became less complicated and he executed a very intuitive uh, night sacrifice, mm -hmm. which he did not realize when he did it. But apparently he went back. I mean, when he opened the newspaper the other day, he was praised a lot uh, by every chess uh, committee that is out there saying it's the most uh, innovative move that we have seen. So Caspro mentions that the undisciplined wanderings of mind is a human trait. One machines probably won't ever master. Oh, but the thing is how AlphaGo is beating humans because he does um, ordinary moves like what that one. Yeah. Oh. 
How can you argue? <laughs> Then you give me an aspect of Gary. Gary is always suppressed. Very smart guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Not Gary Mark. Gary Kasparov. Kasparov, yeah. So, just to summarize, the lessons that I've learned after reading the book are we shouldn't be worried about computers. That, that anyway, is our job. <laughs> the element that separates human intelligence from artificial is emotion. Uh, intelligence is also about psychological and emotional endurance, as he points out. And artificial intelligence still hasn't reached its uh, tipping point. So, I think we should take it from the person who has been the burnt of it, who has faced the burnt <laughs> of, uh, artificial intelligence. Now, now you know why I found it emotionally, I can see that. Right? <laughs> so, uh, this is a lot of things, but something goes on emotionally. Right. But emotionally, I cannot talk about it. And uh, in conclusion, uh, at the very ending of his book, he says this, humans need machines to turn our grandest dreams into reality. And if we stop dreaming, we might as well be machines. So I, I thought that was very nice. And that is my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I